Thanks to Yah who gave us the ability to live through six working days. Come back here to this house of prayer in the seven. This time let us even face our land and give praise to the king of the universe who has allowed us to stand in this house of prayer. We are so misanecha mi panecha. Kuma yahoa. We are fusu oebecha. We are no so misanecha mi panecha. When we cry, rise up, O Yah. Let thine enemies be scattered. Let them that hate thee flee from before thee. Rise up, O Yah. And let thine enemies be scattered. And let them that hate thee flee from before thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Baruch Yahoa. Baruch Yehovah Pesorai, Baruch Yehovah Pahele, Baruch Yehovah Pelayla, Baruch Yehovah Yom Yehovu, Baruch Yehovah Tzami, Yehovah Elohim Ubevakasha, Lislorach Lanu Lechol Yevarim Ra'im Shasimu Lemanecha Yom Yom, Veliyot Yimalu Kol Hayom Haze, Lemaan Shemcha Yehovah, Elohe Abraham Yitzchak Yisrael, Elohe Abotinu Eli, Nishmoa Bekolina, Im Tetsemotcha, Lamaan Shemcha Yehoa, Nehalel Yah, Hallelujah, Yochai, Yochai, Shabbat Shalom Nechem, Shabbat Shalom Nechem. I hope you're ready for learning this day. We're in Parashat Ki Ketz Day. When we go out to war, all these difficult situations in life, the Creator knows. And when you hear the uh, commandments that He says, they affect the most intimate situations and the most violent situations that we could be confronted with. We give thanks to God that he gives us a way of wisely handling these things. And so let us prepare our hearts for this day and all that we will get out of it by singing Zerashabad, which is on page three. We see one of these quoted Yom HaShabbat, the Kadashor. 
מצבנו יכולה לעשות את כל החוקים האלה לירע את יהוה אלוהינו, לטוב לנו כל הימים לחיותנו כיום הזה. וצדקה תהיה לנו כי נשמור לעשות את כל המשרה הזאת לפני יה אלוהינו כאשר סיוון מגיד דברה ליעקב. הוא קרוב משפטה לישראל, לא עשה כן לכל גוי משפטים בעל ידעו Our Elohim, the King of the Universe, who makes us holy through your Mitzvot, and you gave us the Mitzvah, the commandment, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. And you said in your Torah that you have, Yah has commanded us all of these statutes to observe them for our good all our days, to give us life as it is this very day. And in righteousness shall be ours if we would just observe to do all of this commandment in front of you, O Yah, our Elohim. Just as you have commanded us, and your psalmist that we said that you declare your word unto Yaakov, your statutes and your judgments to Israel, the nations know them not. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! We give you thanks for even the parasha. What happens when you go out to war? A difficult time in anyone's life, and even the situations of captivity and. the situations of parenting, the situations of marriage and divorce, the things that people don't like to talk about, yeah. the situations of, of inappropriate situ uh, contact and abuse and incest, you deal with in open daylight in every year's portions, oh yeah. Give us the strength to learn from this, Torah, yes, in these trying times, even in our captivity in this country, oh yeah. Let us see that you want righteousness, righteousness to be pursued, oh yeah. Not to go after the wealthy and the powerful, not to recognize the friend, the friend's face, not to go after the weak, but to pursue what is righteousness. Because you said, "Amishat lelohim," justice it belongs to Yah. May it be your will that our words of Hebrew reading and our words of Psalms and Proverbs and the words of prophecy, as taught by Sarah Haron and even taught by the Kohen. Uh, the day, Eliel, and even those who will speak in the afternoon will be according to your will. Yes. May blessed be you, O Yah, the King of the Universe, who gives us this Torah. Hallelujah! 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 Hallelujah!
Say praise to our power while we have any being. Together we will lift up our voices and gratefully sing. Withhold thy thy voice from ensuing our maker. Let young and old praise him together. Let the tribes come near and testify. Even the tribes of Israel, the mighty of Jehovah. Say among the nations, Jehovah reigns. Thy power, Israel, over all the world. For Jehovah will not cast off his people. Neither we forsake his inheritance. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becoming thy house. Now, O God, and forevermore. Hallelujah. Let us sing the Shema. Shema Israel Baruch Hashem Shel Yehovah Baruch Yehovah Yo 
You may be seated, sisterhood. All men stand for the recitation of the word of the Creator. We give thanks to Yah that we are now in Kitetse. We're ending out the book of Devarim very quickly. About half past the sixth month, so we're near our holy season. And at this time, we're going to be reading in Hebrew a portion of Kitetse de Milchama. When you go out to war, Starting in chapter De Debarim, the last book of the Torah, chapter 24, verse 21, and ending with the end of chapter 25. Verse chapter four, verse twenty one or Kaf Alif in some scriptures. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Kitif Sor, Karmaha, Lotha Ole La Harika, Lager, Layahom, Ula Almana Yehe, Zahar Tagi Eged Haigit, Allah Eves Misraim, Al Ken Anuki Nasawahar, Chapter. Now so the Tabar Hazay. Kigi read. Bein anashim, when he geshu el hamishpat, when he batom, v'hazdiku et hatzadik, v'harshiu et harasha. Hallelujah. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it after thee. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou was a bond man in the land of Mizraim. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. If there be a controversy between men, mm -hmm. and they come unto, to, uh, unto judgment, mm -hmm. and the judges judge them by justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked. Amen. Holy Alakula, Shreatam, Eloheinu, Elohe Abutainu, Abraham Yitzhak, Weapo, the Olawa, Nikreet, Achmenet, Ben Zebulun, Ben Israel. Baruch Yahuwah Yom Yom Baruch Yahuwah Tamid Ubaruch Abba Libra'el HaTorah Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Where he kahu lefanau kede risha at risha ata sida rish ato the mis par arbaim ya konu ya kenu lo yosif ken yosif le hakoto al ele maka raba we ni we ni la akika le eneka lo Taksum, 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 right. Shur, Then it shall be, if the wicked man deserve to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to the measure of his wickedness by number. Forty stripes he may give him he shall not exceed. Lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then our brothers shall be dishonored before thine eyes. Thou shall not muzzle the ox when he treaded out the corn. Amen. 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 Dawid ben Yehuda ben Israel. Baruch Yahuwah Yom Yom. Baruch Yahuwah Tami. Ubaruch Abah Lekrayel HaTorah. Mode, ani lefneka Yehuwah. Mishnatanu et HaTorah. Amen. Ki yeshbu achim yachdav. Umet achad mehem. Uven enlo. Lot ye... 
תיגי אשת המת החוצה לאישה, זאת אומרת, לאיש זר, ובמה יבוא עליה, ולכוחה לו לאישה ויבמה. והיה הבכור אשר תלג יקום על שם אחיו, המת ולא ימחה שמו מישראל. ואם לא יחפוץ האיש לקחת את הירבינתו, ואל תירבינתו השרה אל הזקנים, ואמרה מעין יבמי להקים את אחיו שם בישראל, להקים לאחיו שם בישראל, לא אבא יבמי. יבמי. And one of them die and have no child. The wife of the dead shall not be married abroad until one not of his kin. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to him to wife and to perform the duty of her husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn that she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother that is dead, that his name be not blotted out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate upon unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses, res refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Yisrael. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother unto me. Amen. 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 Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife draw nigh to him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit before his face. And she shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that doth not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Yisrael, 
the house of him that had his shoe loose. Amen. 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 Baruch Yahuwah Yom Yom Baruch Yahuwah Tamid U Baruch Abba Likrae HaTorah When men strive together, one with another, and the wife of one draweth near to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smite of him, and put it forth her hand, and take him by the secrets, then thou shalt cut off her hand. Thy eyes shall have no pity. Thou shalt have in thy bag, thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Amen. Amen. Yes. 
Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hepa. Call. Oh. Oh. Say. A net. Call. I say. I yeah. I yeah. I will. I. I will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thou should not have in thy house diverse measures, a great and a small, a perfect and just weight shall thou have, a perfect and just measure shall thou have, that thou days may be long upon the land which a whole of thy power giveth thee. For all that do such things, even all that do unrighteously, are an abomination unto Jehovah, thy power. Amen. Amen. Abraham Israel. Zakor eight Ashir Asalka Amalek Bederek Besek Ken Nimis Ryan Ashir Quarka Baderek Y Zani Beka Ko Hane Hane Ke Shalim Akareka we are ayi ayi we yagia we lo yare elohim we sika we haya we ha niak yahoa eleheka le ka miko we veka misa viv be edits ashir yahoa eleheka no ten the pa nakala we reach the team pay at Zekir Amalek Mita Kat Hashemayim Lo Tish Tish K Tish Kak. Amen. Remember what Amalek did us to thee, by the way, as he came forth out of his rhyme. How he met thee, by the way, and smote the hindmost part, hindmost of thee. All that were enfeebled in thy in thy rear, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not Elohim. Therefore it shall be, when Jehovah thy power hath given thee rest from all thy enemies round about, in the land which shall thy power giveth thee for inheritance to possess it, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget. Amen. Amen. Oh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Brothers may be seated. Giving all honor, glory, and praises to the Creator of heaven and earth. You can tell I haven't been up here as a martyr in, in many years. Uh, that I would forget that prayer. My apologies to you all and to the Creator that I was amiss and not remembering that prayer because after a while you don't use it, you lose it. So we're going to do a couple of things today in my short time up here. Uh, we're going to start with the Mahatiyas portion, which I'm going to run through very quickly. It's uh, only 10 verses, will be found in the book of Isaiah, 54th chapter. So Isaiah 54, we'll be covering verses 1 through 10. We have a bit of a problem because uh, for some reason, and I haven't had a chance to talk to Moray yet, our screen is not up without words, and so the next portion I'm going to cover, unfortunately, you won't be able to follow it on the screen, so I'm going to ask for your, uh, your undivided attention when it's time for me to read that portion to you. So we're going into Isaiah 54th chapter. 
and uh, the first verse, let's read it. And I'm going to ask uh, my brother, um, if you can get your hands on the James Allen book, uh, so that you can read that portion, because uh, Jimmy I was not going to have it. He, we, he couldn't get it up on the screen. I still want to cover that portion. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. I feel like this is my first time. Okay. In the book of Yeshiyahu, the 54th chapter, the first verse, Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saying, Yah. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth thy curtains of thy habitations. Spare not. Lift in thy courts, and strengthen thy states. Okay, so we're dealing with one of the what they call the Haftro of uh, consolation, where uh, I believe there are ten, where we work our way up to Yom Kippur, and these were set up, of course, by some of our actually adversaries in certain ways, and uh, but we use these portions and we try to make some sense of them, and uh, in order to get our spirits right for Yom Kippur, it's very important that we. Um, be able to understand that this portion here is comfort that the Creator is giving us as a people so that we will not carry all of the burdens of our sins into Yom Kippur. He's trying to relax our spirit and give us confidence to know that in spite of everything that we do, we've done, and we probably will do, He's still there for us and He's still giving us forgiveness. And so this is what this is what they're saying here. So there's, they're enlarging of the borders of Israel saying that when we come back into the land of Israel, the Creator is going to even make more room for us, right. but we have to come back in the spirit of truth and righteousness. Right. Let's continue. Amen. For thou shalt spread abroad on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall possess the nations, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and the reproach of thy widowhood shall thou remember no more. For thy maker is thy husband, and Jehovah of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is thy Redeemer. Yah of the whole earth shall he be called. Again, uh, there's a lot of plain common sense talk here. I'm not going to try to make it elaborate because it's not. It's very simple. The Creator is again reminding us that in spite of our ways and our doings, that He is everlasting in mercy and compassion. Um, the second part of my time up here, I'm going to remind us that this is not a religion. You can't, you know, this is all good and, you know, it might make you feel all high and, and, and confident and, you know, you know, relieved that the Creator has remembered us, but that does not take away our responsibility to do the right thing. To think right, to speak right, and to act right. And so I'm not going to make this all pretty for you um, in spite of the fact that I understand what my role is here. And I'm praying that uh, we will take this to heart to know that there is nothing that we haven't done that the Creator will either deal with us in mercy or forgive us for. Right. Yeah. And so we have to come into this understanding and, and don't let this nice talk fool you. We still have an obligation to do certain things and to get the hopefully the redemption from the Creator that will come on your keyboard, even so. For Jehovah have called thee as a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit. And a wife of you, can she be rejected, save Yah? For a small moment have I forsaken thee. But with great compassion will I gather thee. In a little wrap I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have compassion on thee, save Yah. Now keep in mind that his moment for us is 400 years or even longer, a couple of centuries, if I might add. And so, you know, it's very poetic 
the way it's put on this paper. Right. But it's a lot more serious than this. Mm -hmm. And I don't want us to get cajoled into thinking and relaxed into thinking that, uh, you know, the creator uh, is, uh, you know, going to be fooled by our fakeness and, uh, you know, our uh, insincere yeah. humility because he's not. And but again, I, I, I remind us all that the creator is compassionate. He is ever loving and everlasting in kindness. And that's a given. He's given that to us. No holds barred. In other words, we don't have to do anything for it. His mercy uh, at this time. But we still have obligations. And we need to talk about that. That's right. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth. So have I sworn that I will not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains may depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall my covenant of peace be removed. Save Yah that have compassion on thee. Hallelujah. Again, you know, it's... Um, no, I, I, I'm just bringing this up for the fact that I'm speaking from my heart because I just got the call this morning that we needed a mock team. And I volunteered for the, for the role because um, I know how important it is for us to start getting ready you know, for, for the holy season that's coming. And so that I just wanted one of my messages to get out along with all of those others who stand in this spot. And... He tells us, his kindness shall never depart from me. And it doesn't. But even in his mercy, sometimes we have to suffer. <laughs> because there has to be consequences. And so, again, I don't want us to take this thing too literal, even though <clears throat> Yahweh means what he says. I now want to go to a portion of James Allen. And uh, we're going to be going into the book uh, Out of the Heart. And I got to find it. So give me a second. But we're going to be going into a James Allen portion. And I apologize that we don't have it on the screen. Because when we read these types of portions, your looking at them helps you to internalize them better. And so. Uh, for that reason, it's so important that we have it on, on the screen or we have it in writing. If I had even known that this was going to happen, I would have made copies because it's so important that we understand these things. And this is how really what I'm talking about is how we're going to prepare to get the blessing that the Creator just gave us in Isaiah 54. Okay? Um, now all of a sudden, it's acting like it's my web page is... <laughs> So what is our, uh, did somebody disconnect a wire in there? Looks like the Wi-Fi is on. The Wi-Fi is on? Let me try uh, this again. Having difficulty connecting the Wi-Fi. You having problems it's too? too? Yeah. It's slow? Um, it's not, it's not. You want me? Would you mind, please? So Man proposes and Yah disposes. That's right. Huh. I just gave that expression to a young man today. And that's usually a good thing. So now, we are in uh, James Allen, Out from the Heart, and the first chapter is The Heart and the Life. The Heart and the Life. Okay, and I need you to just sit tight, just listen, because you cannot see it for yourselves. All of those of you who have phones that can connect to this, please pull it up on your phones. Okay? All right, so my reader will start for me. As the heart, so is the life. The within is ceaselessly becoming the without. Nothing remains unrevealed. That which is hidden is but for a time. It ripens and comes forth at last. Okay, so before we go too far, let's start breaking it down. So he's saying that the heart, as the heart, so is the life. In other words, what... And, and keep in mind, he's going to interchange the heart and the, and the mind. Uh, he's going to interchange those words. And really what they're talking about is our spirit. Is the things that we think and the things that we feel. It's our emotions. And he's saying that whatever's in your heart 
and whatever is in your mind is going to trans is going to manifest in your life. So if you're thinking wrong thoughts, if you're feeling bad feelings, it's going to be reflected in the life that you that you live. Okay? And so he's saying that I don't care how hard you try to keep it within your spirit or in your, well, your mind, which nobody can see, sooner or later, it's going to materialize itself in your thoughts, I mean in your words and in your actions. Okay? It cannot be, uh, it cannot go unre unrevealed. Seed, tree, blossom, and fruit are the fourfold order of the universe. From the state of a man's heart proceed the conditions of his life. His thoughts blossom into deeds, and his deeds bear the fruitage of character and destiny. So everything that we're thinking sooner or later is going to turn into an action. And those actions are going to really determine our destiny where we're going and what's gonna happen in our lives. So when we have bad thoughts and bad feelings about things that we think that we can hold in and we can fake and, and act a certain way, sooner or later, it's gonna come out. It, it has to come out because that's who you really are. Now, you know, we have situations in relationships where people, you know, they can, uh, you know, they can fake a long time, you know, they can play games and, you know, because when, they, when somebody wants what they want, if they're very selfish, and most of us are, uh, we can, okay, well, how am I going to get from A, point A to point B? Point B is that girl or that guy that I got my eye on. I got to do certain things that keep them thinking that I'm the right one for them. And once uh, we get there, then we can let our guard down and we can be who we really are. Okay? Now, the thing is, is will point B, the person at the other end of that uh, uh, journey, that goal, can they hold out long enough to see if you're going to let your guard down before they get what they want? And will they be the same person that they started out with when they were standing over here? That's what we're talking about here. Sometimes it takes years to find out who people really are. And so, in those cases, you really got to be keen and you got to pay attention. But let's read on. Life is ever unfolding from within. Always changing. And revealing itself to the light. And thoughts engendered in the heart at last reveal themselves in words, actions, and things accomplished. Exactly. So it's not just about relationships. It's about everything that we do. It's about everything that we want. It's about everything that we aspire to. Even the things that we don't aspire to. If we're paying attention to the hand of Yah, sometimes he's guiding us and we're really not making these decisions for ourselves. He's helping us make the right decision if we're paying attention. You have some people that already establish what they want. They don't care how they get it. They already got their mind set on it. And they're not listening to Yah who is giving them sometimes what they call an obstacle is a wake-up call. Right. It's nothing more than a wake-up call. And we have to be able to pay attention to the wake-up calls because what it might do is divert our attention from what we think is our actual goal and send us to another place and take us to another, uh, another portion in life. And I'm saying all of these things to say that as we move towards Yom Kippur and trying to get our lives all right, we have to realize that Redemption is not free. Mercy is not even free. Mercy is earned. I mean, you know, and, and some people say, uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, things that the Creator gives is unearned mercy. What's the term that they use? I can't recall it now. But trust me, the Creator is watching everything that we do. And we can play games with each other, but we can't play games with the most high. Let's read on because I don't want to cope with my time. As the fountain from the hidden spring, so flows forth a man's life from the secret recesses of his heart. Mm -hmm. All that he is and does is generated there. All that he will be and do will take its rise there. Sorrow and happiness, suffering and enjoyment, fear and hope, hatred and love, Ignorance and enlightenment, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. are nowhere but in the heart. They are solely mental conditions. They're mental conditions. We create them and we establish them in our in, in our spirit and in our thoughts. We think that those are external, that external things make us happy, and external things cause us to suffer, and external things give us enjoyment and peace or fear and hope. That is all a part of you. Right. That Amen. is all a part of where your mind takes you. Amen. And so all of the good stuff you heard in Isaiah 54, it's not going to matter if the things that you're doing within your spirit and in your heart don't help you to get to, to that salvation. I don't want you to get it twisted. I want you to understand that you still have a major responsibility to change how you think, to change what you say, to change what you do, to change how you fake it. Because sooner or later, uh, you know, even if the Creator gives you uh, mercy on Yom Kippur, your life is not going to change. Because you haven't changed. That's what we have to do. We have to make changes. Man is the keeper of his heart, the watcher of his mind, the solitary guard of his citadel of life. That means that's his, his fortress. His citadel is his fortress. And he can protect himself from the outside world or the things that, but most of the things that are happening are happening within his own spirit. As such, he can be diligent or negligent. He can keep his heart more and more carefully. He can more strenuously watch and purify his mind. And he can guard against the thinking of the unrighteous, unrighteous thoughts. This is the way of enlightenment and bliss. That's how you're going to find your salvation. It's not going to be in the words of Isaiah 54. It's really not because that's just the creator reminding you that you have another opportunity to receive his salvation and receive his blessings. But again, you're going to, going to be the one by the things you think more so than anything else because everything else is coming from your thoughts. And until you correct your thoughts, all the other things that are going to manifest from them will not help you out of Isaiah 54. I don't care how much you read that and you want to get your confidence in that and your security in that. That is really not all that you need. You, in other words, we all, every one of us in here and throughout the world have the opportunity to better their lives or to make it worse. Just by how you perceive your, your, your surroundings. Just like the people in the Bahamas. They can uh, cry and moan over their situation or they can figure out a way to pick themselves up and say this is just another opportunity the Creator has given me. If I survived it, then I have to find a way to overcome what I went through and make a better life for myself. They can either do that or they can find a palm tree to sit under and cry for the rest of their lives for their losses. That's all, of, uh, and the only thing that changes whatever they decide to do is what they think about their situation. That's the only thing that changes the destiny that they're going to have for the future. On the other hand, he can live loosely and carelessly, neglecting the supreme task of rightfully ordering his life. This is the way of self-delusion and suffering. Just what I was talking about. Let a man realize that life in its totality proceeds from the mind, and lo, the way of blessedness is opened up to him. For he will then discover that he possesses the power to rule his mind and to fashion it in accordance with his ideal. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Let a man realize that life in its totality, in its totality proceeds from his mind, and lo, the way of blessedness is opened up to him. This is the way you're going to get where it is you're trying to go. I, I, you know, my fear is that we, as Israelites, if we're not careful, are just keeping church on Saturday. If we turn this into a religion, if we think that, you know, we're going to come up here and all even these men, they are accountable. Every one of us, myself, we're all accountable for what we do. 
Just because we have a title, just because we have prestige, just because we have money, all of those things don't matter to the Creator. He's looking at our actions and He's watching us. And He is going to determine whether we're going to be successful or fail. And the reason why I say that is because there's things going on in Israel. And if we just look at the leadership as the people who are going to give us the salvation, we're definitely going to hell. Excuse my language, because we can't depend on them. We cannot depend on leaders to, to guide us into uh, prosperity and righteousness and all of that. We have to guide ourselves down that path. Right. We, it's our choices and our decisions. And if we decide to stay in, in, uh, behind a person who's not giving us what we need, that's not their fault. That's our fault. We cannot blame them for being, for being failures or for failing us. Because we've over that the yeah, that we've elevated them above a man or a woman. Still like and I don't care what kind what kind of titles we put on ourselves, we're all common to the Amen. creator. Amen. Don't look for anybody to give you what you need. You have to start with yourself. You have to start with your mind. Because if you can start with your mind, then you can make better choices on who you want to follow or who you want to lead. Because you could be a leader or follower, and you could be both. But who are you going to follow? Or who are you going to lead? Are you going to lead the righteous and the willing heart? Or are you going to lead somebody who's out for evil? And you're just going to help them accomplish it. That's all I'm saying. Let's read on. So will he elect to strongly and steadfastly walk those pathways of thought and action which are altogether excellent. To him, life will become beautiful and sacred, and sooner or later, he will put to flight all evil, confusion, and suffering. For it is impossible for a man to fall short of liberation, enlightenment, and peace, who guards with unwearying diligence the gateway of his heart. The gateway of his heart, the things that you allow into your mind, is really what he's talking about. The gateway to your heart is what you allow into your mind. What type of thoughts are you entertaining? What type of thoughts are you shedding? Are you resisting? That's your salvation. The Creator has, has already given us carte blanche to say, listen, I'm going to always be merciful. That means he ain't going to punish you as hard and harshly as he could. It doesn't mean he's not going to punish you. Right. I don't want you all to walk away with reading Isaiah 54, 1 through 10, thinking that, oh, this is it. I'm good. Oh, this is making me feel good. And yet, in your mind, you're still thinking the same thoughts. You're still saying the same things. You're still doing the same things that are contrary to the Creator. And you're hiding behind uh, your name, your title, uh, whatever it is your shield is to protect you from your reality and what people see in you. That's not going to win. I hope and pray that I haven't dampened your spirits, but I have really given you an opportunity to think more clearly. Uh, what you could do on your own, but if I have been able to encourage you to understand how we get to where we want to go, how we individually uh, come before the Creator as we get ready for Yom Kippur, so that um, this is not just another year of fasting and potato soup, you know, and, 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 and crackers and juice and water and whatever it is we're waiting for at the end of the day. That we understand that it's an opportunity for us to get our minds right. I'm not even talking about your life. I'm talking about your mind. Because until you get your mind right, you're not going to get your life right. And that's what we have to do. Amen. All praises to the Creator. Hallelujah. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm going to start paying more attention to these prayers when I just in case I get called up here again. Total Rabbi, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Give it stronger. Give it stronger.
for him being able to come up and be the one who was able to deliver the message of prophecy this day. Uh, I'm not going to uh, add to his words. I want them to resonate with you. At this time, let us even continue with the praise of Yah for giving us this Torah and the prophecies, going along with them. With the song HaTorah, we will say, say go, HaTorah. Close the Torah, but we will learn at this time. Ah, Proverb to the day before we go into the Torah class as well. Let's give praise to God with the song of Unity on page 8. Fingers spread, our hand is weak. How to gain the strength to see those that Thank you. 
76 song, which reminds us of the whole week season. It's only a couple of weeks away. At the end of this uh, three or four weeks from now, we're going to be in Yom Teruwa. Right after that, we're going to be in Yom Kippur. Right after that, the festival of Kippur. This means, in Hebrew, Kodav Yehud has a meaning. He said, the Lord said, Lord, he just said, the name of the Lord, Mount the Lord, that's beyond. That's the beginning of the 76 song. In Judah, another name is known. And in Israel, his name is great. And it is in peace that he dwells, and his dwelling is in time. Hallelujah. No doubt in Yahuda I'm 
Understanding put forth her voice. In the top of high places, by the way, where the paths meet, she stands. Besides the gate at the entry of the city. At the coming in at the door, she cried aloud, Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye thoughtless, understand prudence, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall utter truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing perverse or crooked in them. They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all things desirable are not to be compared unto her. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of devices. The fear of your is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. By me, by me kings reign and princes decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me. And those that seek me earnestly shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, enduring riches and righteousness. My food is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my produce than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and that I may fill their treasures. Jehovah <coughs> made me as the beginning of his way, the first of his works of old. 
I will set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no deaths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the field, nor the beginning of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he set a circle upon the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above, when the fountains of the deep showed their might. When he gave the sea his decree that the waters should not transgress his command. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as a nursling. And I was daily all delight, playing always before him, playing in his habitable earth. And my delights are with the sons of men. Now therefore, ye children, hearken unto me. For happy are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Happy is the man that hearkeneth to me, watching daily at my gate, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoso findeth me, findeth life and obtaineth favor of Jehovah. But he that misseth me, wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me, love death. Shabbat shalom. Time. Let's keep the applause going. If we could even uh, give thanks to Yah as we have the 24th Psalm telling us about who He is. We have Him in our life. And we have so many things going on in this world that we know that we can lift up our heads. We can have confidence. We can have strength. I appreciate uh, Ima Rishona for, for even reading that with dignity. It's a good example to all of our family how important these scriptures are. Let's all say the 24th Psalm. The earth is Jehovah's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the mountain of Jehovah? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not taken thy name in vain, and hath not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from Jehovah and righteousness from the power of his salvation. Such is the generation of them that seek after him, that seek thy face, even the God of Selah. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be lifted up the everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? Jehovah strong and mighty, Jehovah mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, they lift them up the everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who then is the King of glory? Jehovah's host is the King of glory. Selah. At this time, let us give praise and honor by rising to those who are in our midst. After giving praise to Yah, we thank Yah for our elders, our salvation, and the moment we may extend to so many others here. Including the congregation who teach this day, give thanks to Yah for the sisterhood and the brotherhood. And at this time, let us even welcome the Kohen Eliel, Ben Kohen Mikael, the Nelly Ben Israel, to the breakdown of the portion of the year. Hallelujah! 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 At this time, our young you may be seated. Our Yeladim may go to their um, classes on their level at this time. I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge the sorrow of the body of Sar Aron, giving thanks to Yah for his life, the words that he was able to share with us, to just strengthen us in this path. It's very important that we have leaders in our nation and in our midst to keep us focused and aware of what our goal and purpose in life should be. And the fact that we have a creator and a power that's holding each and every one of us accountable for our actions and how we carry ourselves and live in this earth today. I would also like to acknowledge our elders and give thanks to Yah for each and every one of your lives. Thanking Yah for allowing you all to be here to praise and glorify his name. I would like to acknowledge each and every brother and sister, boy, child, and girl child that's here today. And thank Yah for this opportunity that he's blessed each and every one of you, of us to have, to have this holy convocation and praise and glorify him. But he is a power that is due of such praise, glory, and honor. And let us never forget it. Amen. The creator is awesome. There are no words to 
describe his greatness and his might and his hand in each and every one of our lives day after day, time and time again. Our portion of study today will be taken from the book of Deuteronomy, the 21st chapter and the 10th verse, where we will continue in the laws that the Creator left on record here. And Moshe at this time in our history is reiterating these laws before the children of Israel. We are just beyond the Jordan at this point in our history, about to cross over the Jordan, and Moshe is about to make transition. But before doing so, he saw it fit to reiterate the laws to that younger generation, to also give them a lesson in history of what we went through, their fathers and mothers and many of those who made transition, and the mistakes that they, the younger generation that is, would not want to make and follow in the, following the footsteps of their parents who lost their lives because they didn't trust in Yah and because they chose a path that was contrary to what the Creator had taught us and was trying to groom us as people to be. This portion of study is sort of a continuation, as Colin Shake Me I mentioned, which was a segue in last week's portion leading up to this place where it spoke of how we would treat or deal with uh, one that we would take captive when at war with our enemies. Right. The name of this Sidra is Ketet Say, which means when thou goest forth, because it continues the very same thought of what was mentioned in Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, uh, beginning from verses 10 right through as it go to verse 19 as well. And there were laws that taught us how to treat our captives and how we would treat people in general because these laws that Yah gave us weren't only set up to where we knew how to treat one another. We had to consider others. We had to consider humanity in general and understand and know that as a nation of priests, we were not just to serve one another, but we serve humanity and not just speaking of how to treat one another, but in action as well and how we lived and carried ourselves and treated those that we made contact with. This portion of study begins in Deuteronomy, the 21st chapter and the 10th verse. I just want to let you know, uh, we may just uh, forfeit our lunch break today. <laughs> Let's see everybody looking around. <laughs> You see, when you stand here, you have to bring some form of humor. You have to also understand that this is not, this is not a, a way of life where we just all stuck up in gun ho about being serious and rah, rah, rah. We can have laughter. We can have fun. We can understand this history, these laws, and know how to apply it in our lives and, and live a happy life. Live a comfortable life. Live a life doing right before the Creator. This is what the Most High wants of us, and this is what He seeks and desires of us as a people. I'll try my best to get through this portion in a timely manner. I just ask that you hold all questions until the question and answer period, uh, which is later on this afternoon. That's if you don't want us to eliminate the lunch break and just go right through this portion and take up the lunch break as well. At this time, we will begin our portion of study in Deuteronomy, the 21st chapter and the 10th verse, and it reads on this wise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ki te te ne mo kama, awo e veka, unta no yoho eloheka, o ya deka, ta. When thou goest forth to battle against thine enemies, and yoho, thy power deliver them into thy hands, and thou carriest them away captive, and seest among the captives a woman of goodly form, and thou hast a desire unto her, and wouldest take her to thee to wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thy house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thy house, and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou mayest go unto her, and be her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be. If thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not deal with her as a slave, because thou hast humbled her. This woman that we're speaking about, this is not an Israelite woman. Right. This is a foreign woman. And we at times would go to war against foreign nations. And here the Creator is teaching us in our law 
we don't just deal with our captors or slaves as savages the way we were treated as slaves when we were brought into these lands of our captivity. They raped our women. They mistreated us, whipped us. They did all kind of bad and wrong and evil things to us because they saw us as their slaves. Our culture is not like that. The creator of our power, there is a form of decency in all that we do. And so we cannot be inhumane. So the Most High, even in the portion previously last week, as it relates to the very same thought of going to get, going into battle, the Creator told us when you go to war against your enemies, we couldn't even just destroy the trees. Because some, some, uh, some enemies, there was a form of war warfare where they would just destroy your crops, burn all your fields, starve you to death. The Creator said, Israel, you can't do that. Those that that good food have nothing to do with your uh your your issue with that person over there or with that nation that you're at odds with. Your your this food or the animals there had nothing to do with that. You couldn't just go there and slay all of these animals and kill everybody in a, in an inhumane manner. The Creator said, We have what you call rules of war. Today they have the same. There's a very same thought in some countries as well. They have rules of war where there are do's and don'ts, a way that you would treat the enemy. And even in these societies today, that's not done. When you consider Vietnam and many of these wars, they went over to some of these countries, raped the women, were barbaric towards the children and the captors. They did all kind of inhumane things to these people in the way they tortured them and so on. And our culture, the creator, is saying this is not so. If you see a woman as a man and you, you choose a captor amongst these slaves and you desire to take her, this is the man in which you would, in which you would do so. Right. The creator said you had to bring her home. You had to shave the hair from off of her head. This gave you time to reconsider and think about this whole thing. Do I really want this woman? Or is it just the fact that because I was at war away from my wife, I saw this woman and I wanted someone to be with. And so now having time to take her home, you would think about this. Well, I'm home with my wife. I've been with my wife two or three days. Do I still want this lady or not? It was something that would give you thought and make you consider whether or not you want to follow through with this process or not. If you decided you were going to follow through and you did take her to be your wife, the creator is saying after that, if you had no delight in her, meaning maybe you realized, well, after cohabitating with her, you know what, I really didn't want this at all. I just saw her and this was more of an act of lust or a right. desire right. because I didn't have my Isha right. there. Right. Now you decide you don't want her anymore. The Most High is saying you cannot just sell her off or treat her as though she's worthless right. because you humbled her. You, you had sex with her. You cohabitated with her. So now you have to set her free. Let her go and live amongst the people because she already went through enough considering the fact that you slaughtered all her family and her husband or if she had one or all her loved ones. So you letting her go and setting her free to live amongst us now would be a way of kindness, the Creator saying, this is our culture and this is how we do things. Tom Shee. Okay. And if a man have two wives, the one beloved and the other hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be. And the day that he calls of his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved of the of the beloved the firstborn before the son of the hated who is firstborn but he shall acknowledge the firstborn the son of the hated by giving him a double portion of all that he hath for he is the firstborn of his strength the right of the firstborn is his he is the true beneficiary and so the most high said you cannot deny this child his right as firstborn because of your issue with his mother the fact that you dislike her and you prefer your other Isha over her, the Most High is fear in all his doings. And he's teaching us to be so as well and how we carry ourselves, learning how to be ethical men and women and the way we treat one another, even in our families and in our homes. He's saying this child, the firstborn of the woman that you hate, he's the true beneficiary. He should be the one that receives the right of the firstborn. So if or when you make transition or set up your will, you need to ensure that this son has what's due his as firstborn. And if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son that will not hearken to the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they chasten him and will not hearken unto them, 
Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of his city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of this city, This our son is a stubborn and is stubborn and rebellious, and he doth not hearken to our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones, that he die. So shalt thou put away the evil from the midst of thee, and all Israel shall, shall hear and fear. Disrespect of parents. This was not tolerated in our culture. The Creator said that the punishment for this was death, is death. Today we see children in so many homes believing as though they can say whatever they want to the parents. And the societies that we live in today has a system established and in place to where it tolerates children being able to speak back to their parents or have their way in the home. So much so to the point where there are laws. You have to be mindful of how you chastise your child. Be careful. Don't be seen in public giving them a spanking with your hand. Talk to them, hey, you're on timeout. Go in a corner. These are the things that this system today has, has, has established or put in place to prevent us from properly chastising our, ch our children. And yet we all know even those who create these laws in this system, you spare a rod, you spoil a child. Some of these same people who are condoning this, when they take their kids home and they out of line, they yoking them up and beating their behind looking around. Because they know when it's all said and done, sometimes a good mock cop or butt whooping is the only solution to a child when they're just completely out of line. And so here the creator is saying in our society, this here will not be tolerated. If you had a stubborn and rebellious child, they mentioned so many things, gluttony, drunkard, because that's what it eventually leads to. When this child starts becoming stubborn, rebellious, disrespectful, they believe they could do whatever they want right. because they're getting away with it. And we're tolerating it and allowing it. So when it gets to that point, the Most High is saying, you bring that child before the leadership. We had judges and officers at that time. Those were head, those that were head figures who would place judgment if we had a situation that required judgment to be placed on any individual. And so we would bring the child to them, which in most cases were the elders, a body of elders, wise men and women. Uh, your priests were also probably there. And they would come and say, listen, okay, what are the allegations or charges that are being brought up against this child? Well, we have such and such. We have this. We have that. There are a few witnesses. He cursed out sister so-and-so, the neighbor over there. She told brother so-and-so this, that, and the third. Now that we have witnesses at the mouth of two or more witnesses, we can now place judgment on this child in this situation. And the creator said the, uh, the judgment in such a case, that child would be put to death because this here will not be tolerated. Thomas. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt surely bury him the same day. For he that is hanged is a reproach unto Yah, that thou defile not thy land, which Jehovah thy Elohim giveth thee for inheritance. This here, we don't see this as common today because of the fact that we're not publicly hanging people in this in society today. But in ancient days, this was something that was done. If someone committed a sin worthy of death, they would be hung in public. They were public hangings. And if that was the case, the Creator saying, our Lord, the Most High wants us after, at, at a certain point, the Most High is saying, at sundown, you take this person's body down and you bury them. Because that person is a, is a reproach to him. This is a hateful thing. The Most High don't want to see that person here. They did a wrong that upset the Creator. And taking their life was justified because of what they did. So at that point, the Most High is saying, after you've hung them, this person is dead, take this body down, bury them. We continue in Deuteronomy 22, and it says, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep driven away and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely bring them back unto thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, and thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it home to thy house, and it shall be with thee unto thy brother required it, and thou shalt restore it to him. And so shall thou do with this comor, and so shall thou do with his garment, and so shall thou do with every lost thing of thy brothers which he hath lost, and thou hast found thou, that thou mayest not hide thyself. 
Thou shalt not see thy brothers come more or his ox falling down by the way and hide thy soul from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. We are truly our brothers, our sisters keeper. Amen. And that's not just a statement, but we have to show this in action as well. We had a case this week where Maurice Chanwell had a situation. He posted out a message in a brotherhood chat. Brothers got together, made it happen. Whoever was closest, we got out here. We couldn't say, oh, um, I don't like Maury. Mm -hmm. Maury didn't help me a couple of weeks ago. The brotherhood chat just go dormant. It's silent, Maury sending posts and chats. Nobody responded. Yeah, you, and we create a separate chat group. You see what's going on there? Yeah, you know, we, who gonna help? I ain't. No, he did. None of us don't know. He did in his spirit. The next thing you know, he's out there stranded. Yeah. The creator is saying here, in ancient days, we saw it as a comma or an oxen. Today, a brother's vehicle might break That's down. Right. He might have a situation where he needs assistance at the home and he can't do it himself. We're our brother's keepers. That's where we come in. We help out. We don't just turn a blind eye, turn our face and pretend as though we don't know or we don't hear or we don't want to get involved knowing that this person needs assistance. Right. And this is the thought here. The Creator is teaching us that we have to consider how we live, how we treat one another. We have to be stand up men and women. Right, right, right. Genuine men and women. In spite of whatever issues we have with one another, we have to learn to see past them. Because we will have this agreements and issues one amongst another but can we see past that for the better cause for the better thing for what's right and still do the right thing in spite of how we feel or what that person did or said to me whether they mistreated me or not and this is what the creator is teaching us here this is why many scenarios were given here ox falling down by the way you need help you see here, uh, if your brother be not nigh unto thee, it doesn't necessarily have to be a biological brother. Right. It can just be a, a close brother, a close Israelite, a close friend, someone who's in need of assistance here. This is the thought, and this is what the Most High is teaching us. Amen. 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 A woman shall not that a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For whoso doeth these things is an abomination unto your whole of thy power. We have to understand what's been happening in society today. There are families and mothers and fathers playing games with our children, dressing them up, dressing the little boys up like girls. He looks so cute. She looks so cute. Starting them from young. Next thing you know, the child is putting on a, the brother, the male child is putting on girl clothes and looking in the mirror. He now want to perform in a show or a play at school dressed up like a little girl, dressed up like a little boy. And this is how we begin to perpetuate these cycles of negativity and evil in our nation and in our midst. The Most High is saying don't do that. Don't find yourselves wearing clothing or things that pertain to a woman, uh, putting it on our young men or our young daughters wearing the things that are, are, that are masculine or male clothing or male attire and pretending to be men. Because now what you do is you start messing up their minds. And that's where the world is today. They're corrupted and destroyed mentally because we now have a society where we believe in and we're accepting homosexuality and lesbianism. It starts from this very thing here, just dressing them up. Something just as simple and as plain and innocent that you may think doing this as a child is, but yet, as they grow older, you corrupt their mind and make them start thinking differently. And now we have an issue in the entire nation and even in our society. Thomas, you. And if a bird's nest tent, if a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way, in any tree or on the ground, with the young ones or the eggs and the dam sitting upon the young, or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young. Thou shalt in any wise let the dam go. But the young thou mayest take unto thyself, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days. Doing this good, kind act would prolong your days, would prolong our days. There are, this is a preventative method in place because this prevents species from becoming extinct. You could have a case where if you're so inconsiderate, you look and you see, a clean bird there, by the way, you pass them, oh wow, that's a clean chick, that's a clean turkey. Because they're wild turkeys, you know. 
They flying all over the place. You go in certain places, you might look and you see a turkey sitting on some eggs, and you go, let me just take her and the eggs. You eat up the turkey and the eggs, how will that animal, how will they start multiplying? They even have, today there are laws in some countries where they have hunting seasons. Preventative methods to protect these animals from being extinct because they have deer hunting season. They even have it for the unclean animals. We don't eat them, but they have seasons for hunting wild pigs or what have you. Because there's a time during a certain, there's a certain time of the year where these animals, they procreate faster. And so now that you have a lot of deers running around, we have to have a way to maintain the deer population. So they create a hunting season for that time so that you can hunt from this time of the year up to this time of the year, that particular animal, but then at a certain time it ends because we don't want you to take all of their lives or make that animal extinct. We just wanted you to maintain the, that population growth. Now from this point you hunt a different animal. Right. This was the concept and thought here. The creator was teaching us this very thought in his law way back then. He's telling us, listen, if you see an animal, a bird on this nest here, take the take the take the eggs and leave the mother. She can always go and have more little ones. Right. At least you allow that cycle to continue. And you just take the eggs as opposed to taking them all and cause this animal species to become extinct. When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a parapet for thy wolf, thy roof, and thou that thou bring not blood upon thy house if any man fall from thence. If you could pull up a picture here, Maury, we have a picture with a parapet here because we have to realize that even in construction and, and doing things that we may see are necessary, just the thought of building a house, we had to be considerate of life. Because you know how many construction sites even today, there are people that lose their lives because there are no safety rules in place. That's why even in, in the work environment today in general, you go on just about any job, they have what you call safety rules. Rules to protect people from becoming, from harm from befalling people or anything from happening. And in constructing or building a home, that border that's going around the house, that's called a parapet. It's sort of like a, a, a veranda, if you want to call it, to protect the construction workers on the roof so that if you get too close to the edge and for some reason you slip, you will just roll down and you can hit that wall, that protective barrier around the house, which is the parapet, and no one would lose their life. Right. We're very superstitious as well. You get to that house and you're like, I don't want to live there, brother. You ready to sell that house now to somebody that you know? Give me a history on it. Word around is brother such and such died during that construction process. Ghosts are on that house. That brother Drew is over there. We go over there, I done heard people talk whispers in the night. You know how we are. It's the most high saying, I don't want nothing like this to happen. And to prevent this, set up that parapet along the roof so that no one lose their life. Thomas you. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with two kinds of seeds. Lest the fullness of the seed which thou hast sown be forfeited together with the increase of thy vineyard. And so this thought here, if you would read the next verse of Akasha as well. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and a camor together. Thou shalt not wear a mingled stuff wool and linen together. And so there's a thought here first, I'm going to start with verse 9, where the Creator is teaching us to understand the thought of having everything, if you're going to plant something, you get 100% out of that seed and not graft it. This is common today where we're grafting fruit, we're grafting trees, you have your, you have your lemon, and lemon and orange mix. You have so many things, and, it, and it's gotten to the point where today now, these things are being sold in a store, and you don't even know that they're grafted right. fruit. And this is unhealthy. You're not getting the fullness from that fruit when you consume it. It's having an effect on our bodies, a negative effect. The Creator and all His knowledge knew this, so the Most High is saying, don't mix two kinds of seed. You want to grow oranges? Grow oranges That's alone. Right. Plant that separate from the grape seed, so that the both of them grow separately. He said, lest the fullness of the seed which thou hast sown be forfeited together with the increase of the vineyard. Then it continues and says, thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together, because you have to understand these two animals have different personalities. You have to know how to separate them. The, 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 the ox, he want to work. The, the Kamor, he's, 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 he's stubborn. 
He's turning, pulling the opposite way to Kyle, trying to go and get the job done. And he don't want to get the job done. He upset for whatever reason. And most eyes say, no, don't work them together because you're defeating the purpose. One animal want to get the job done, the other one's against the mission. He says here, thou shalt not wear mangled stuff, wool and linen together. Clothing, when you buy your clothes, your material, check it, read the label. They have mixed fabrics together. This is against our culture. Today in this society, they don't care about none of this. We have to care. We have to understand and know what's going on. They've taken it so far to the point where they're even mixing these animal species together. They have animals now that they call the ligra, a combination of a lion and a tiger. And if you look at some of these pictures, if he po when he posts them up, you'll see there's no way a ligra could survive in, out there in a wild. The animal's too big. It's so much so to the point where he's huge, he's bloated. How is he going to hunt down a rabbit or any animal? He can barely run or move himself. So now, he, how is he going to survive? Not only that, I was made aware, Mishare uh, Yaakov and I, we were discussing it today, and he mentioned the fact that the Creator and His wisdom is so wise that even when they, even when they mix these animals, their genes, the animals still come out to a point where it cannot reproduce on its own. Wow, you see how the Creator, in His own way, created a system that prevents that cycle from becoming perpetuated. Right. Now you have libras producing libras. The most high said, if you want to do it in your foolishness and in your craziness as man, I'll cut it off right there. I won't allow the cycle to continue. That's right. mm -hmm. And this is what we have. You also have the zebroid, a combination of a zebra and a horse. The mule, a combination of a horse and a donkey. Look at what we do today in our corruption. These animals, ordinarily in society, you'll never see them mating with one another. Some of these animals are enemies. But yet, we want to, I wonder how that would look if they combine and we put them together to see what it'll look like. The Creator is saying this is an abomination. This is anti-God. This is against our culture. Every concept and moral that we stand by. Tom Sheep. Thou shalt make thee twisted cords upon the four corners of thy covering, wherewith, wherewith thou cover thyself. That's our fringes. We have them on today. This is the lawyer, Zizio, Tom Shady. And if any man take a wife and go unto her and hate her <coughs> and lay wanton charges against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman, and when I came nigh to her, I, I found not in her the tokens of virginity. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the token of the damsel virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hated her. And lo, he hath laid wanton charges, saying, I have found not in thy daughter the tokens of virginity. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the garment before the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him. And they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel. Because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. And she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. And so in this case here you have a situation where a man married a woman. And this was done the right way. He married her before all Israel. He had no problem with marrying her, walking down the aisle with a smile on his face. Hey. Hey. Proud of his sister. Proud of his sister. Arm in arm. Now, after some time in the marriage, he decides he don't like something for whatever reason. She may have said something or done something. He decides now he's going to slander her name. And he starts spreading rumors. She wasn't a virgin when I met her. And all kind of negative things he's saying about her. It was customary in our culture that after a male, when this male took a woman and they cohabitated for the first time, he had to bring those sheets that they cohabitated on and give that to the parents as a sign of tokens of her virginity. Right. The parents would hold on to that because this shows that I raised my daughter right. This shows that my daughter was a virgin when I handed her over. You have cases or situations where a woman may not show those signs during cohabitation for the first time, but if for some reason or another during that process when she was in her father's home something happened and caused her hymen to break and her lose that, her parents had to make that known to this man when he took her on. 
They had to say, listen, this was the case, brother, such and such. You need to understand some things, but this is what happened. And he's aware of that, so we have no surprises. Going forward now, if this man decides to slander this sister's name, what happens is he has to now come before the elders and the parents would do so. And they would present the That's evidence. Right. Listen here. This is the case. This is the evidence. This brother slandering our daughter for whatever reason. This man now came before the elders and they would chastise him. Whether they gave him stripes, the elders' council would decide. The leadership or the judges at that time would decide. Whatever punishment was due to him, the judges and officers at that time would determine what that punishment would be. Then... He, it mentions here, it says he may not put her away all his days. Right. He couldn't decide he don't want her anymore. Right. If the judges and officers or parents decided, listen, because of this, we don't even want our daughter to have him. Right. They could do so, but it was not on him. He couldn't determine that he don't want her anymore. That's right. He had to keep her. He was stuck. The judges and officers could make a decision or even the parents along with them could say, listen, we don't even want our daughter to be with him in the first place. They could make that judgment call and take her away or, or, or get her out of this, this, this situation because they realized it was not in her best interest or family's best interest to keep that union going. But the man could not nullify that marriage. Tom Hallelujah. But if this thing be true, that the tokens of virginity were not found in the damsel. Then shall, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of the city shall stone her with stones that she died. Because she hath brought a wanton deed in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So shall thou put away the evil from the midst of thee. We see here the hand of the Creator and what the Creator is not prepared to tolerate, and that is harlotry. The Most High, we'll see it later on, the Creator saying, because she has played the hardest, this is the reason why she's going to be put to death. Meaning, she's been sleeping around before this time with other individuals, and it may not have been known. And so this man had to make this known early, as opposed to wait until he's upset with her, then bring out these allegations against her. But an investigation would be done either way to determine whether or not this was true or false before putting his sister to death. Tom Sheehan. If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they both, then they shall both of them die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall thou put away the evil. from his father. This is adultery, this is not tolerated. The Creator is saying put them both to death. If there be a damsel that is a virgin betrothed unto a man, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then he shall bring them both out into the gate of that city, and he shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel because she cried not, being in the city, and the man because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. So shall thou put away the evil from the midst of thee. When a man is betrothed to a woman, they're engaged. If another man cohabitate with that woman, that is adultery. This is our law and our culture. The Creator is saying they both shall be put to death. That's if she's, this is done in a city. In a city, you have neighbors. There are people right next door, right around the way. We should hear some sign. I live right next door to you. In many cases, we had communal living. Somebody may have been in the next room. We didn't have a situation in some cases, a lot of times in these cities, like today, everybody in their own place, wall soundproof and all this crazy stuff we got going on today. No, it was no soundproof business. A curtain might have been separating your, your place from the next brothers. So there ain't no way you could say, I didn't say, he didn't hear when I was calling. That's the system and society that we lived in at that time. So it's not like today. Today our minds are going, well, yeah, may have had soundproof walls. Well, she could have had this. No. At that time, all those, this technology wasn't in place today. A little sheet, a little piece of sheet rock, a little plied board might have separated y'all. The top may have even been open and just something covering, just giving you a little privacy. So homes back then weren't like this. If she shouted, or oh, we knew something, what's that noise going on? We heard something. Somebody knew something was happening. And so in a city, they both were to be put to death because you should have said something or even after you should, we should have heard you come crying out. Ah, this happened. He held me down. He held my mouth closed. Then we could run and chase the brother down and figure out what's going on. That's right. Tom she. But if the man find the damsel that is betrothed in the field and the man take hold of her and lie with her, 
then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises, rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field. The patrol damsel cried, and there was none to say. In a field, this is an open area. You could have been miles away from any form of any form of any place where anyone was living or anything of that sort. She's crying out. No one can hear her. So we have to give her the benefit of the doubt. In this case, only the brother's going to be put to death because in this case, she could have shouted, but no one heard her. But we're expecting her. We can't see five, ten weeks later, a year later, then we hear about this incident. She should come soon after and mention or say something. Listen, this is the case. I was out in the field. This brother took advantage of me. This is what happened. I'm making a report right now. And so here, the male alone would be put to death because of the scenario being different. I'm sure. And if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, that is not patrolled, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his Again, days. Again, it says he may not put her away all his days. He cannot just assume that, listen, he can take advantage of this young daughter, whether it be swindling her, because there are some men that sometimes they take advantage of a younger person or someone by swindling them. He get in her head and tell her things to make her feel as though he's interested in her. After cohabitating, now he has no interest. He no longer has an interest. He just was pursuing her because of the act that only. So here the Most High is saying this is not tolerated in our culture. If you pursue her, you swindle her, you get her interest, you talk to her, you cohabitate with her, she's to be your wife. This is how unions were made in our culture in ancient days, and it should be the same way today as well. And so, in this case, the Creator said he has to pay, he has a dowry to pay, he has to make that payment. The, the damsel's father still has the choice to determine whether or not she want him to be her husband or not. And here the elders as well and our judges and officers at that time would make the judgment call as well. Because the parents may say, listen, we don't want this idiot to be our, our daughter's husband. Right. We don't like how he took her. But he cannot make that decision. It's all taken out of the balls, out of his court. The decision is out of his hands. That's what's happening here. We have to understand the thought and what the creator is doing. You cannot commit an act to, to believe or assume that you can predict what the outcome would be because of your actions. The Most High said, I'll take that, that, uh, that power out of your hands. You can determine what the outcome is going to be. You're set in this place here. This is what the outcome is going to be for you. You can only do this, but we have a body of authority that can determine otherwise. Chapter 23. A man shall not take his father's wife and shall not uncover his father's skirt. This is against our culture. Every moral thought that we carry or that we live by as a nation. A man going to his father's wife. And just to bring thought on the other place as well, which are the other our law that I just mentioned, there are some cases where in some culture, in some cultures and countries, even in Guyana, you have cases where the young men would go and cohabitate with a daughter because he feels that if I cohabitate with her now, they have to give her to me. This is the reason why in this law, the creator gives us a place where the parents can and the judges can make that decision to annihilate that union or make that union never happen. In this case, here, this is cut and dry. You shouldn't go into your father's wife, your mother. That's God's. And the Most High will not tolerate that in our culture. The, the sentence or the punishment for that was death. He that, he that is crushed or maimed in his private parts shall not enter into the assembly of Yah. A bastard shall not enter into the assembly of Yah. Even to the tenth generation shall none of his shall none of his enter into the assembly of the Most High forever. Therefore, here, in this case, it says, he that have his stones crushed or maimed. You have your stones crushed. You may have been in an accident. 
You had to, you, you're a unit. You had to have your private parts removed for whatever reason. The creator is saying you cannot enter, in, enter into the assembly of the creator. A bastard seed. This is a child born of, in, of an incestuous relationship or uh, born in an adulterous relationship where you're, in a, you're, a, you're a product of adultery. You had cases where the truth may not have come out until years later. So that child was born. No one ever found out. Now that we've done an investigation or somebody come out and say, listen, on a deathbed, I just have to be honest and tell everybody. I couldn't hold this on, on my deathbed. Such and such, I committed adultery and this, is, this child is this, that, and the third. Now we know. We, now we know. So we can put the parties to death, but what happens to the child? Therefore, what yeah. we're saying, the law says now, she said blow child, that's a term used in the Caribbean, they say that's a blow child. But here, what happens to the child now, we can't just go and put that child to death. They're already born. But the law teaches us that once we find out before, we put both parties to death so the child's never born. Now that this child is born, this is a bastard See, The creator saying, this child, this type of child should never enter into his assembly. We even had the case where Dawi, when he committed adultery, the Most High took the child's life. Because this, the creator is showing us, this is not tolerated in our culture. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the assembly of the Most High, even to the 10th generation. So none of them enter into the assembly of Yah forever. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt. Amen. And because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pithor, from Aram, Nacharaim, to curse thee. Nevertheless, Jehovah thy power would not hearken unto Balaam, but Yah thy power turned the curse into a blessing unto thee. Because Yah thy Elohim loveth thee, thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all the days forever. We had a personal vendetta with these Ammonites and Moabites, and so the Creator is saying, don't bring them into my assembly. Don't bring them into your place of worship to worship with you all because of this incident and what took place here. This is personal. Don't bring them in even unto the 10th generation. Still, none of them are to come in here. You all should feel the same way that I feel is what the Creator is showing us here. Tom Sheep. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Mm. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou was a stranger in his land. The children of the third generation that are born into them may enter into the assembly of Yahweh. And so the Creator is teaching us, in spite of all that Edom has done and is still doing today, the Most High is saying, don't abhor him. Also, the Egyptians, because of what they did to us as well, the Creator is saying, hey, you can dislike what they've done. I'll give you up to the third generation to hold that against them. <laughs> but after that point, they can come in because when it's all said and done, Edom is still our brother. And the Egyptians, we were once their, their slaves. The Creator is saying, you have to consider this and the fact that they, there is still some form of connection with Edom. And also in Egypt, you were slaves there. They could have destroyed you to the point where you no longer existed. So here, you have to consider this. Even in disliking someone, the Most High is showing us how to maintain some form of consideration and dignity in doing so. That's right. When thou goest forth and camp against thine enemies, then thou shalt keep thee from every evil thing. If there be among you any man that is not clean by the reason of that which chances him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. But it, but it shall be when evening cometh on, he shall bathe himself in water, and when the sun is down, he may come within the camp. And so if a man finds himself in a place where he becomes unclean by, uh, for chance by night, a wet dream, we know it as today, the Creator is saying he has to stay without the camp. When he becomes clean, then he can come into the camp. This is if we're out at war because the Creator is still there in our midst and he wants us to understand that even if you're not at home and you're not in your usual surroundings, you still have to maintain some form of cleanliness and consideration because Yah is wherever we go. Right. And we have to consider that in how we live, how we carry ourselves as well. Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, where thou shalt go forth abroad. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapons. And it shall be, when thou sittest down abroad, that thou shalt dig therewith, 
and shall turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. For the Most High Elohim walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee, to deliver thee, and to give up thy enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unseemly thing in thee, and turn away from thee. This is why you have a place called a rest area, a latrine. That's why the Most High said, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad. A separate place that's specifically for that. We're not just moving all around. You got to go, oh, I'm right here, chill there, whatever. You just start in your home and you do what you need to do right there. No, there's a place for that. Go to the latrine, go to the rest area, a specific place that we've set aside for that purpose. You go there, but the most high saying, cover that which cometh from you, because right. his ruach is there amongst us. He should see no unseemly thing, not just what you did, but in us, because of our acts. That can be the unseemly thing. Our actions and our behavior can become an unseemly thing before the most high as well. And so the creator is saying, understand how to live and how to be clean cleanliness being next to godliness even in our actions and in our behavior as well thou shalt not deliver to his master a bond man that is escaped from his master to thee he shall dwell with thee in the midst of thee in the place which he shall choose within one of thy gates where it liketh him best Thou shalt not wrong him. This man, this man escapes from his cat, from his master. He's a slave being mistreated. The creator said he find himself, or he find a way to you all and asking for some form of safety and protection. Don't take him back because he was mistreated there. There's a reason why he left in the first place. Take care of him. Give him housing. Right. Help him or her out because this is who we are and what we represent. Something good. We're there to help those that are less fortunate and those that are in need. There shall be no harlot of the daughters of Israel, neither shall there be a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot or the price of a dog into the house of the Most High Elohim. For any vow, for even both these are an abomination unto Yah. This is not tolerated in our culture, harlotry. Our males making prostitutes of the daughters, right. sleeping around with right. women all over right. and just handing them, passing them around from one brother to the next. Or a woman out there selling herself on that level. This is all harlotry. No sodomites amongst the men. We don't have men messing around and sleeping with other brothers. Right. This here is against our culture. It's not tolerated. It's nasty. In society today, it's tolerated. It's okay. Yah is making it clear. It's not okay with him, and it should not be okay with you and I. Because Amen. we are Israelites and we represent the power Amen. of this universe. Thou shalt not lend upon interest to thy brother, interest of money, interest of victuals, interest of anything that is lent upon interest. Unto a foreigner thou mayest lend upon interest, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon interest. For the Most High Elohim may bless thee in all that thou puttest forth thy hand unto. Land, whether thou goest in to possess Your brother's in need in the first place. You lending upon interest only puts him in further debt. And the Most High is teaching us to be genuine and fair with one another. He's in need. He needs something. You loan it to him. When he, ha when he has it to give back, he gives it back to That's you right. at the same price. Right. No interest added on there. Right. And so likewise, the Creator is saying interest of money, interest in victuals, interest of anything that is lent. Because he can loan you. He can give you a pair of shoes. Loan you, you can loan him a pair of shoes or whatever it is and say, listen, I need two when you're done with that. Mm -hmm. I need two patono when you're done with that one. So whatever it is that you loan him, don't loan it to him on interest. It's different if it's a business transaction. Mm -hmm. If this man needs to borrow money to do for business because it's an investment and he want to make more, that's a different case. You two have a business a transaction here now, you can discuss this as two businessmen. Mm -hmm. The creator is saying, however, with a foreigner, you can loan it to him upon interest. He's not your brother. You can make something out of that hustle. This is the power that we have. He understands how we treat one another. He also understands that there's a way to deal with others as well. I love it. I love it. You hear what I'm saying? So we know how to treat one another. And all that we do, we still are able to live and survive in this society and in this world that we live in. That's right. When thou, when thou shalt make a vow, a vow unto the Most High Elohim, thou shalt not be slack to pay. For your whole thy power will surely require it of thee. And it shall be a sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips, 
thou shalt observe and do, according as thou hast vowed freely unto Yah thy power, even that which thou hast promised with thy mouth. This, there's a thought behind this if you read clearly everything that was said. And it's beyond just vowing to the Creator or making a promise to Yah and not fulfilling your promise. The Creator is teaching us to be genuine men and women. Men and women of integrity. You say you're going to do something, do it. You make a promise, follow through with your promise. Be, be an ethical human being. Don't be someone who has a reputation around the place and he never does what he says he's going to do. Yeah, she said that and it never happens. This we do not want. And so the Creator is saying, more or less, much less when you consider me, your power. If you're going to make a promise or vow before the Creator, you have to fulfill it. And this is what the Creator is teaching us. There is no sin in not vowing. Right. But if you vow, you must follow through. That's right. When thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, then thou mayest eat the grapes until thou have enough at thy own pleasure. But thou shalt not put any in thy vessel. When thou comest into thy neighbor's standing corn, then thou mayest pluck ears with thy hand. But thou shalt not move a sickle until thy neighbor's standing corn. Let me bring it up today for you. You go in somebody's house and they say, you can have a little of that juice over there. Right. You go in the fridge and you drink out the whole mug of juice. <laughs> and you go on your way. Brother, such and such company. Choose. You need to leave none back for me. Be considerate of others. The Most High said, they allowed you to have some, don't take it all, and don't even consider the person whose it belonged to. And so here, this is what it was. In ancient days, they had a vineyard. Today, we have a refrigerator. In ancient days, they had a cornfield. Today, we might have a bowl of some a bowl of some food that I tell you you can have some of. Like during a lunch break, I say, here, you can have some of this. I come and you done clean the bowl out. That's how we can put it in today's society and what we do and deal with today. Be considerate. Someone give you some, take some, leave some back. Tell me, Chapter 24. When a man take up a wife and marrieth her, did it come to pass, if she find no favor in his eyes, because he had found some unseemly thing in her, that he writeth her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it into her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, and she departed out of his house, and goeth, and becometh another man's wife, and the latter husband hated her, and writeth her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and send of her out of his house, or if the latter husband died, who took her to be his wife, her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled, for that is an abomination before Yah. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which Jehovah thy power giveth thee for inheritance. This here law prevents the disrespect and degradation of our women. We have to understand that there's a lot more that goes behind this. There are many other presentative methods in place here as well, uh, or that establish you you can this you can take something out of this because you realize we're not making prostitutes of our women either. And also, you have a case like this. If this law is not in place, you'll have men just passing women around willy-nilly as though this is something free and that can be done easily at any time. This law here is established because if a man took a woman and for some reason or another, he decided he didn't want her anymore. He saw some unseemly thing or for some reason the relationship just didn't work out. They just weren't compatible for, with one another. And they separated. There had to be an official bill of divorce that was given to her. Because that bill of divorcement was set up or established in our society to avoid any complications going forward later. So now when he give that woman an official bill of divorce, it had to be made known. That couldn't just be between the two of them. I know we ain't together, you know we ain't together, we ain't telling nobody else nothing. That way now you find brother such and such is cohabitating with her and you saying on the side, well what's going on? I thought y'all were, I, I thought y'all were, I didn't know such, we don't have, we don't want to have those complications. Now you have a feud between two men or two women or for whatever reason or another because this brother 
the one he claims he divorced her, but he never gave her anything official, and yet such and such is dealing with her on the side, and this is not made clear, not just between the two of the brothers, but between the community or the nation at large. So the Most High is saying, if you separate from this woman, you need to give her an official bill of divorcement. Right. Once you've given her that bill of divorcement, if she go and remarry with another male, and the two of them are together, and he gives her a bill of divorcement, you cannot take that woman back to be your wife. Or even if he makes transition for whatever reason, something happens between the two of you and you're no longer together, her previous husband cannot take her again. Right. Because he has defiled her, the man defiled her. The woman is not defiled, look at it. It says the man defiled her in his act. This act you've done or committed has defiled her because you're handing her around. This is not tolerated in our culture, the thought of a man dealing with a woman as a prostitute or disrespecting her or degrading her. That's what's the defiling thing here. And so the Most High is saying, that's not tolerated. I will not have that done. You cannot do that because what it does is it creates a system where you're degrading the woman. She's being disrespected. It's looking bad on her and her reputation because Brothers are going to start looking at, looking at her in society with a certain image. Oh, she's over there. She slept with him. She slept. That's what happens to women. A lot of times in society today, no one looks at the male. The first person they look at is the sister because it degrades her and destroys her reputation. And the Most High saying, this is not going to happen in our culture. Tom Shee. When a man taketh a new wife, he shall not go out in the host. Neither shall he be charged with any business. He shall be free for his house one year and shall cheer his wife whom he hath taken. No man shall take the mill or the, or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. And so here the Creator is telling us when this brother go to wife, if he takes a new wife, he's not to go into the host or go into the army. Why? He could lose his what he could lose his life, and now his wife is going to be a widow. Give him time to be there with his wife, spend time with his wife, cheer her, cheer his new wife, then he can go on into the army. It mentions here about taking a man's millstone to pledge. It says, thou shalt not take the mill, upper millstone, or thou shalt not take, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. If someone owe you something, then we can bring it up to date in today's society. If someone owe you something, let's say, for instance, this brother's an electrician. He owe you some money. You can't go and take all his tools and you holding them as, as, as collateral or you holding them to pledge. Now, how is he going to work to make some money for you? That's how he generates his income with his tools. Give him what he needs to make money. Take something else or let him give you whatever he decides is best to give you for him for you to hold for pledge as opposed to you going and taking what you want. You may take something that's necessary for his livelihood. Therefore, the Creator is putting this method in place to avoid that from happening in our society. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren, other children of Israel, and he deal with him as a slave and sell him, then that thief shall die. So shall thou put away the evil from the midst of thee. This is a sin worthy of death. You cannot kidnap anyone. What you've done is you've cut them off from being able to live their life. You hear so many cases of children being abducted and kidnaps taking place around the world. People kidnapping some child and taking them off to another country, have them working as a slave. We can't do that to one another is what the Most High is saying. You kidnap your brother and sell him off as a slave, you cut him off. He can no longer serve the creator. That nation or wherever he's held captive may be serving a false deity. Now he's been cut off from God. Any brother or sister or anyone in our culture found kidnapping one of their own brothers, the sin was worthy of death. Take heed in the pledge of leprosy, that thou observe diligently and do according to all that the Kohanim, the Lewiim, shall teach you as I commanded them, so ye shall observe to do. Remember what the Most High Elohim did unto Miriam, by the way, as ye came forth. This is something that we today don't really have to deal with or relate to, any forms of leprosy, but we had laws of leprosy in our culture and in the Tanakh here, where the Creator told us how to handle any case or situation where there was leprosy involved. The Most High is telling us here, through the mouth of Moshe, take heed to those laws, remember them, 
follow them. Also remember what Yah did to Miriam as well when she when when we left by the way and we came forth out of Egypt. He plagued her with leprosy. And one of the things behind or the thoughts behind many times individuals being plagued with leprosy was us living or carrying ourselves in the wrong manner, which would cause the Creator to place leprosy on us or in our midst. When thou dost lend thy neighbor any manner of loan. Thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Thou shalt stand without, and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring forth the pledge without unto thee. And if he be a poor man, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. Thou shalt surely restore to him the pledge when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his garment and bless thee. And it shall be righteousness unto thee before Jehovah thy power. And so this here is showing us again how to be considerate how to be men and women of integrity, how to be considerate of our brother who's less fortunate, who when it says this brother here now, he loan, it says he, you loan him something and he has it in his home and now the time is up and you want it back. You can't just go busting into his house. Where's that thing that I gave right. you? You come okay. busting in his home looking to find your stuff. That's disrespectful. The Most High is saying you have to be considerate and you have to realize that, listen, just because he's less fortunate doesn't mean you take advantage of him and mistreat him in his situation. Creator is saying, wait outside. Let the brother bring it back to you. If for some reason he's not in a place to, um, to give you back what you owe him or whatever, if, you, if you're holding something of his, give that back to him. And just allow him as your brother to work on, work on it when he have time and give you that money or whatever it is that he owe you. But don't take advantage of his situation and his inability to give you back what he borrowed you, what he borrowed from you. Or the fact that, listen, you loan him something now, you feel as though you have him under your control. He has to do as you say or follow your bidding. Thou shalt not oppress a hired servant that is poor and needy. Whether he be of thy brother or a stranger that is in thy, or a stranger that are in the in thy land within thy gates, in the same day thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, as he cry against thee unto Yah, and it be sin in thee. Wow, this is amazing because this show and really this here teaches us how to not take advantage of people that are less fortunate. You know, someone's poor and needy, and now you find them there in a place where you're just taking advantage of the fact that this person here is a, is a hired servant, and you feel as though, you know what, I can treat them anyhow. It says here, in the same day thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and set his heart upon it, lest he cry to Yah and the Creator take it out on you. Because this person is in need. They say a prayer to the Most High, please deal with this person. I've been working hard. He's holding back my pay. You holding back his pay because you want to use that as collateral to, to generate some additional funds. You a businessman. Yet it's affecting him and his survival and the survival of his family, his livelihood. He, can, he can't provide for his family because you want to take that money. Just, just give me an extra week with it. I can flip it over and make two times that. Then I'll give you it back, brother. Creator saying, no, this person pray and cry to me. I'll deal with you because of the fact that you're mistreating this person. You're taking advantage of this individual. The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the father. Every man shall be put to death for his own That's sin. That's plain and simple as it. No, no Christian JC concept. No man's going to die for my sins or your sins. We all have to be put to death for our own sins. You're held accountable for your actions. And so if you do a wrong, the creator's going to look at you or I and punish us accordingly, not someone else. Thou shalt not pervert the justice due to the stranger or to the fatherless, nor take the widow's raiment to pledge, but thou shalt remember that thou was a bondman in Egypt, and Jehovah thy power redeemed thee from thence. Therefore I command thee to do this. Do thing. not change the law justice system in favor of or against anyone because of their situation, right. condition, or status. Right. 
whatever it is, you're 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 changing the law of justice. That's why the creator says, do not pervert. Do not pervert the justice due to the stranger because he's a foreigner. He's different. We gotta treat him different, you know. He's a, he's a lot of Right. Right. True. Look up to them differently than our own. That's how some of us are. Right. Or he's far, she. This person is fatherless. They they stole that. They just they just really needed it. No, the justice system is in place. This is the these are the punishments for wrong or whatever. They have to be punished or dealt with accordingly. In spite of the fact that they're less fortunate, in spite of the fact that they are this is a man or, or woman of status, they rich or whatever, same law. That's right. Tom sheep. When thou reapest thou harvest in the field, and hast got a sheep in the field, thou shalt not go back to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And that the most high Elohim may bless thee in all thou and all the work of thy hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bowls again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the get grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it after thee. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. Having consideration for others, giving assistance to those in need, being humane. This is what the Creator is teaching us in this law. And so in that time, you allowed your, when you reap your harvest, you left some back. You didn't glean the field, take every little crumb and every little scrape and scrap left back. Make sure there's nothing left for nobody. This is mine and mine only. Just selfish. The Creator is saying, no, be considerate of others. Be considerate of those that are less fortunate, others that are in need. Today you see someone, you may go to a place where you see someone who's in need on the street. They're begging. You pass them every day. You see this homeless person. Wow. Man. I have a little extra today. Let me give them something and help them out. You know, I see this Zaquena. She's an elder. She needs assistance across the road. All these cars just passing, and she needs to grab her hand and give her some assistance. Help her over the road. Help her out. Help people that are in need or less fortunate. Be considerate. This is what the Creator is teaching us in this in this law here. In ancient days, we applied it one way. Today, we can apply this very law in a different manner, considering the society that we're living in. That's right. Hallelujah. Chapter twenty-five. If there be if there be a controversy between men, and they come into judgment, and the judges judge them by justifying the righteous and condemning the wicked, then it shall be. If the wicked man deserve to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to the measure of his wickedness by number. Right. Forty stripes he may give him, he shall not exceed. Lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother shall be dishonored before thine eyes. In this case, we do not want to be inhumane. Where we beat our brother to the point where he urinates on himself or he passes out. The Most High is saying we have to consider the fact that even though he committed a wrong and he's being punished, don't overdo it here. Don't beat him to the point where now he's dishonored or disrespected before the people. He passed out, he urinated, everybody looking, oh wow. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have that. This is what the Most High is teaching us here. So he created, sets out a rule and a law here. Forty stripes is the furthest. Don't exceed it. You don't have to give him 40, but that's the most you can give him. And so the Most High said, if you're going to give him the 40, don't go beyond that 40 stripes. That's right. Thou shalt so not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Don't cover up the ox's mouth and he's treading the corn. He's working for you, but you don't want him to eat or nothing. You're just that selfish and you don't want him to have none while he's working. At least give him some. Let him eat something while he's working for you and making you wealthier. If brother dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not be married abroad until one not of his kin. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of her husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn that she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother that is dead, that his name be not blotted out of Israel. And if he, see God, and if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to raise up 
until his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband brother unto me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife draw nigh unto him in the presence of the, in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto the man that doeth not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that had his shoe loose. At that time in our society, there were certain proprieties in place that were understood. And this was a sense of decorum that was morally correct at that time. Today, the way, where our minds are today, we consider this law with a whole different state of mind. Because for us, we're thinking of, well, what if he don't like her? What if she don't like him? The way our society thought then was different. And it was morally correct for a man after his brother made transition to consider what's going to happen to his wife. What's going to happen with his name? What's going to happen with his legacy? And so it was morally correct and it was thoughtful of not just the brother but for the family to say, listen, we want it's necessary and it's very important that this uh, one of his brothers or near kinsmen take on this woman to help her out in this situation and to help her continue in life. That was considered to be an admirable act, a virtuous act. And so now you had a case where if for some reason that man decided, listen, I don't care, I don't want to do this. It looked bad on him. The woman in most cases wanted something like this to happen. She wanted to continue her husband's name. She was looking forward to someone in the family considering her. So there was no negative thought or connotation behind this to where everybody was saying, well, I don't think he's best for her. I don't think this. All of that back talking, that whole, that wasn't there in the situation. Now, if you had a case where that was, we had judges and officers there that would determine what the outcome would be. But this case here is speaking of the man who decided, listen, I don't want to follow through with this act. The creator is saying here, if for some reason you had a brother who came and said, listen, I don't want to be with the system. For whatever reason, the judges and officers came, they spoke to him, they said, listen, man, you know our society today, this is morally <coughs> correct. You understand the concept right. and the mindset right. behind what you're doing? Right. Yes, Zachary, this has been going on for years in our culture. I clearly understand. I don't want to pursue, I don't want to marry her. For whatever his reasons were, he decided now he still doesn't want to do it. This was, a, this was an act that took place, the creator saying, they both would come before the elders, the sister would come and spit before him, and now he would have, his, he would have this name or this label as the man who had his shoe loose because he did something in society, in our society, that wasn't morally right or good. So that name stuck on you was a bad name, or that was a bad connotation there. So you knew in society that this was the right thing to do to take on your brother's wife. You had the case in our history where in the book of Ruth, Boaz, he wanted to take her on, but he had to inquire who was the next that was near, nearest of kin to her before he could go on and pursue Ruth because he knew that there were individuals closer in the family who had that right before him. But it was something that was proud. It was a good thing. Now, in the case of Boaz, the person that was there, Boaz gave him some incentive to not take her <laughs> by putting some additional things, well, you gotta take care of this, you gotta do that, it's a lot of work, I, I don't know if you really wanna do this. So then the brother was like, you know what, I, I'll let you go on ahead and, and take her on. But there were options there. And so we see in our history how this is not made out to be the negative thing that many times in our question and answer periods we make it out to be. It was all a state of mind, and the state of mind different there was different than it is here today. So you had a question? It's not a question. I just wanted to mention that it also has a lot to do with the laws of inheritance. Okay, exactly. 
And I just wanted to mention before when you talked about, the, um, well, I'll save it for question and answer period. So. <laughs> so that is a very good point that he brought out because as I mentioned even in the um, even in the book of Ruth and in other places you see where inheritance was definitely a factor here because you um, his brother whoever remember whoever the, the brother he had he had wealth or he had an inheritance there and this woman now she really has nowhere no place to go she doesn't inherit what's his but his son would inherit that and it would also give her a place to live and a place to stay. She wouldn't have just have to go back to her father's house because she wouldn't inherit what's his. She went back to her father's home. That's the way our culture was in ancient days. Amen. When men strive together one with another and the wife of the one draw near to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smited him and put it forth her hand and take him by the secret then thou shalt cut off her hand. Thy eye shall have no pity. So this is two brothers who are having a fight. They're having a fair fight. The sister looking, she see that the other, the other brother's getting the upper hand on her husband or her man or whatever. And she decides to take him by the private parts to disable him so that her husband or her man can get the upper hand. Greed is saying, cut off her hand. This was not just some outright cruel act that was done. This was investigated as well. We didn't just have a bunch of sisters walking around with one hand because somebody said, she tried to grab me, and then we just took off our hand. No, we investigated this matter, checked it out to see what was going on. If you were a thief and you broke into our house, yes, yeah, she has a right to grab you there because guess what? She has to defend her home with her each. So she better do what needs, what needs to be done to spare her husband's life. But as I said, this was a case-by-case -case situation. Judges and officers at that time would determine what the scenario was and whether it called for that. And if it didn't, then this was the judgment here. Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights of great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thy house diverse measures of great and a small. A perfect and just weight shall thou have. A perfect and just measure shall thou have. That thy days may be long upon the land which Jehovah thy power giveth thee, for all that do such things, even all that do unrighteously, are an abomination to Jehovah. This is something that's very common in some countries, even in Guyana, where we live, Maurice Shimuel probably know about this. There are places they have two scales or two weights, two types of weights. There's a 50 pound weight, they have this weight that says 50 on it, but that's not really 50 pounds. Then they have another one that's the true 50 pounds. So when they look, they size you up. Nice pocket. Switcheroo. They bring that weight that's not really 50 pounds over there so that they can get more money out of you. Or they bring that different scale. Some scales you can open it up and adjust it, rig it, so that it's showing a certain amount of weight or pounds, but it's really not that. And that's how they do in a lot of places. They size your pocket up. You come driving up in a fancy car, you can afford more. He's not going to question this. That means switch a rule. <laughs> switch a rule. They go at the back, they switch, they bring the other one, you put it up there. So what you need? I need five pounds of tomatoes. Of, uh, weigh it off. You look at it. Uh, give me a little more. That's just a little bit. Uh, that's still a little bit. You sure that's 50 pounds? Look. Yeah, then just give me 100 and be done with it. 100 pounds, you get that extra case of five of them, and you're gone. The Most High is telling us, no, not so in our country. Not so in our Lord. Perfect and just weights and measures shalt thou have. If it's 50 pounds, you need to make sure it's 50 pounds. Don't try to get over on somebody. Some sheep. Remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, as he came forth out of his right? How he met thee, by the way, and smote the hindmost of thee, all that were enfeebled in thy rear, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not Elohim. Therefore it shall be, when Jehovah thy power hath given thee rest from all thy enemies round about, in the land which Jehovah thy power giveth thee for inheritance to possess it, thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget. Moses is telling them, remember Amalek. Remember what Amalek did to us when we, when we just left Egypt. They attacked us from the rear. They took advantage of the weak and feeble. He said, when all of this is done with these Canaanites and you finish destroying them, remember them Amalekites. 
go handle them for what they did because we really never got back true revenge on them the way we wanted to. At that time, we were still we were still a developing nation, and we didn't have the might and the armed forces that we have now to really fight those Amalekites and defeat them the way we should have. But when you finish with these Canaanites, remember them and go go take go go take revenge on them for what they did to you. Don't forget them, or don't make them your friends and become our or, or make alliances with these Amalekites. The creator that we serve is just, he's fair in all that he does. He's awesome, he's perfect. May he teach us and may we begin to understand this law, how to apply it, how to live it, and be just and fair with one another as Hebrew Israelites. If you would, do y'all the honor of standing. Most high God, he only has the power to bless. I was able to pull it off. Good job. Hard on my team. <laughs> I was able to pull it off. In Guyana, I would have never been able to pull this one off. I must say. So you probably the only reason why I pulled this one off. But Yah is awesome. To him be the glory, the honor. May Yah who has the power to bless. Bless each and every one of you according to the words of this blessing found in Numbers, the sixth chapter, in the twenty-fourth verse. Yivarek ka Yehoah wa Yishmarekha. Hey, that's all. Yair Yehoah Panayo Aleka we Kuneka. Hey, that's all. Yisa Yehoah Panayo Aleka we Asim Leka. Shalom. Hey, that's all. Yehoah will bless thee and keep thee. Yah will cause his face to shine upon thee and will be gracious unto thee. Yehoah will lift up his countenance upon thee and will give thee peace. Hallelujah! 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 H